بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين All right, welcome back everyone um, I'm going to read a brief um, bio that Omid um, uh, has given me uh, It's a little simpler than the one that I sent to you before Omid Razayan grew up outside of Chicago The oldest child of Iranian immigrants Haj Omid obtained a degree in economics from Stanford University and his MBA in Entrepreneurship, Strategy, and Finance from the University of Chicago. Between his studies, he spent a short while as a Hausa student. Through most of his career, Omid was a management consultant, most recently at the Boston Consulting Group, where he led engagements for Fortune, Fortune 100 companies and heads of state on matters of strategy, operations, and talent development. He currently works at Google, where he is an organizational development partner and executive coach. In his work, Omid advises leaders, uh, their leadership teams, and their organizations on topics of leadership, teamwork, organizational health, strategy, and execution. At a community level, he has been a mentor, Sunday school teacher, soccer coach, and school board member. Omid is married, a father of two, and resides in San Jose, California. So um, uh, Omid and I go back, um, we are, I think we graduated at the same time in uh, 98, um, but I was at Princeton, he was at Stanford and we didn't know each other then, but then we ended up in Chicago together <clears throat> um, as Hausa students um, under Sheikh Faizi. And, uh, and so we studied for a year with him and then we ended up going to Qum together and spent uh, maybe a year or a little bit more than a year together in Qum. And then, um, and then he decided to come back and he's, We've overlapped to here and there and visited here and there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of finding out more about what he's doing and then hoping that you all can also benefit from, from his career path. So, um, I mean, let me, let me start by asking you kind of, um, well, this, the people who are attending are, um, some are my kids, some are like you say, so the man's uh, son is here, um, some of their friends, our cousins, and that's other people that we've gotten to know each other uh, through this this activity. Um, but they're like uh, upper high school, junior, senior, up to university. I don't think we have anyone outside of that range as far as I know. Um, but the idea is that uh, they have, you know, they're on that uh, at that point where they need to choose careers and choose career path. And um, I thought if they can have more um, scope and see what's out there, then it'll help them to make better decisions. Maybe they'll find something that resonates, get some advice from people who have done good and maybe made some mistakes and, and try to improve even on, on, their, on their successes, both in uh, Deen and Dunya. So um, yeah, so Umid, what, what, um, what do you do in a way that a, a non-MBA at Google can, can understand? Um, well, thank you for the warm introduction and for the question. Before answering the question, I just want to share a couple of resources, given kind of the, the context you shared about the audience. Um, I coach a number of, kind of folks uh, at Google, and I'm also a career advisor. So some of the younger tenured folks, you know, they may be just out of college. This is their first job, and they're trying to make their way. And so I'm, I'm engaging you in that spirit because you're kind of close in terms of age. Um, and two resources that tend to be very helpful for them. One is a book called um, Start With Why. Now, I'm not advising reading the book because it's a bit of a waste of time, I think. But you can go to YouTube and you can find a, a one-hour lecture or a 20-minute lecture, even a two-minute summary by the author. His name is Simon Sinek. And so if you put in um, Start With Why, you will see Simon Sinek and just find like the 20-minute version. And basically what he says is, and, he's, he, and this is a little old, so this is back when Apple was like the tech company. Right. And there were companies like Compaq and HP and, and, and others that were making computers. And he was differentiating. He's like, look, you know, all of them sell computers with this kind of processor and this kind of RAM and techie things. You know, I'm at a tech company, but I'm not a tech guy. And no one really cares. And he says, because they start with the what, like it's the computer. And that maybe they talk, they, they know the how, like, well, you got to manufacture it and it has these widgets and whatever. Mm -hmm. But very few engineers and people in general can articulate their why. And people buy your why. Your motivation also, he would probably argue, comes from your why. So start with your why. Now, as Muslims, we have a point of view on that, but Sheikh Rizwan can get to that better than me. So the example he gives is 
you know, Compaq will come and tell you, hey, we got this processor with this many gigahertz of this much RAM and you can do this blah, 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 and you want to buy a computer. And Apple comes and says, hey, we're all about helping people think different. And we want to help you think different and be free or whatever their pitch is. To do that, we create devices that have the best user experience possible. We happen to sell computers. Do you want to buy one? It's very different. So the video is rather compelling to get you to want to start with why. Then the question is, well, how do you find your why? And he would say, glad you asked. Here's my second book, Find Your Why. Now, if you're going to buy one, that's the one I would buy, Find Your Why. And um, it has three different sections. If, you know, if you're an individual who wants to find your why, if you're working with a team and this team is trying to find its why, or if you're a big organization and you're trying to find your mission, your why as an organization. And so as an individual, you just dial up the chapters on that. So that's one resource. Another resource, and then I'll answer the chef's question, is um, it's a book called Design Your Life or Designing Your Life. Um, I have it here somewhere. Uh, and the story is, these are two professors at Stanford. Uh, they are at the design school. Um, so it's an engineering design uh, school. And the university came to them and said, hey, we'd like you to, to please take the best of design thinking and create a class for our incoming freshmen that helps them design their life. So they put together a class and it was like the most well-received class and everyone who was in their freshman was like, what am I chopped liver? Like, like, how come I can't get the goods? And then one thing led to another and a New York Best Times selling book and a consulting company. And here we are. And because I'm local and I'm alum, I had occasion to be with them. So Design Your Life is a nice book and it has a um, workbook that goes with it. And I normally don't advocate these workbooks, but what the workbook does is it reduces friction because you'll read a chapter, there's 10 questions and odds are you're probably not gonna answer them. And the return on your investment is actually building as you go. So answering the 10 questions or so after each chapter. The workbook is a forcing function. It's all laid out. All you have to do is fill in the blanks with good input. And by the end, you have a nice little kind of roadmap for yourself. And the theory behind design thinking is you're not going to think your way into knowing. You're going to do your way into knowing. And so how do you set up safe to learn experiments before you hedge or invest your entire future into a path that's unknown, how can you become more sure, reduce the uncertainty before you have to invest all in? So that's design thinking. And so I, I think for all of you, this might be something additive. So how can you explore and how you can test? All right, so now back to um, Sheikh's question, what is it that I do? Um, so in my current job, you may have read that Google had um, 12,000 layoffs about a month ago. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I didn't have a layoff nor did my team, um, and in December, my job changed. So my answer is a little, it's a partial truth only because I don't wanna waste excess of time getting you into the details. So directionally, uh, what I do is um, I work with leaders of businesses. So as an example, you might've heard of YouTube, you might've heard of Android, you might've heard of Google Cloud, um, you might've heard of Fitbit. Uh, I'll give you the Fitbit example. Uh, Google acquired Fitbit. It was a $2.4 billion acquisition. And they are now bringing in Fitbit into the Google ecosystem. And well, how does an organization like Fitbit merge and meld? Um, what's the leadership philosophy? How do the teams come into play? How does the geographic distribution of work work? Who are the winners and losers in terms of leadership? And then how do we actually continue to deliver product? These are the types of questions that as an organization development partner, I would coach them on. So that's an example. Another example for a coaching engagement could be, we just acquired a company, that person was a top one, top two person, and now they're one of thousands of engineers at Google. How does this person do that shift? And how do we set that person up to succeed, not just only in the short term, but also in the long term? Um, Can I ask a question about the first thing yeah. you just mentioned about coaching? Yeah. So yeah. why why would you not just, um, kind of do the acquisition acquisition and merger and kind of fix that? Who are you, you're coaching someone who then does the work? Is that the, the model? Oh, no, no. So I'm coaching, well, so in terms of acquisitions and change management, 70% of all large change in an a merger of companies would be considered a large change. 70% of them fail. And they fail mostly because of the human element, not because of the technical or the business element. And so because they know 
we're likely to fail, they want to address the known drivers of that failure. And so the known drivers of that failure is, um, well, it, it's in the human capital bucket. So it could be individual leadership, it could be team leadership, it could be decision-making, it could be like, there's, there's a short list of things. And so they've dialed up a SWAT team, if you will, to help address those things to then tip the odds of success in favor of the acquisition. So the team is in place to do the work, but there are certain um, kind of uh, statistical failures that usually happen. And so you're there to prevent those or like help those not to happen so they can do their work and actually integrate the companies. Is that yeah, accurate? specifically like in the case of Fitbit, and I wouldn't go advertising this because this is internal talk, but I trust our friends. So um, almost 80% of all of their um, workforce were a group of engineers. And so as the engineering integration matching of Fitbit engineers with Google engineers would go, the whole acquisition would go. And so my assignment was, Omid, go lead and help the integration of the engineering teams. So I met with the VP of engineering, happens to be a Syrian guy. And uh, he said, Omid, Saraha, like, can I honestly tell you what's going on? I don't need you to tell me footprint planning. I don't need engineering technology. I don't like... My to, my to do list, as given to me by my superiors, was you know textbook. Go and do these sorts of things. I don't need any of that stuff. I'm like, good, happy we got that out of the way. So what, what do you need? <laughs> <laughs> and and he said, you know, what I need is I need to have a team. So my so if I'm the head of engineering, the SVP, the senior vice president of engineering, and I have underneath me, they had. Um, clinical health engineers. They had um, wearables, you know, because you wear a Fitbit on your back. They had all sorts of folks. And basically, whatever position there was, there was a mirror image on Google. And everyone was, you know, um, having a turf war. They weren't working. So basically, all work had stopped. There was lack of trust. Um, I can go into the details, but he's like, look, right now, everything is ground to a halt. Like, when you look at what's being done, and that's the, one of the key distinctions is what's being said and what's on paper versus what's being done. So I, he's like, I like to get past all of those things, the paper and what's being said. I can tell you hand on heart, what's being done is close to zero because the knives are out. Everyone thinks they're fighting for their job. They don't trust each other. There's no reason why that needs to be there. Folks don't have a reason to trust me, but that's where I need your help. I need you to help me build an effective team because if my leaders get on the same page, then everyone else will follow by and large. But because they're swimming in different directions, everything downstream gets magnified and I'm dysfunctional and I've got a shit product in six months. So the clock's ticking. So how do I do that? And then the reason why someone like me is, I mean, beyond just me knowing this sort of stuff is the internal culture of large companies like Google. So Google has, um, on the order of 200,000 employees, a similar amount of contract labor, so 400,000 people, and it has the buying power of more nation states, right? So when you're that big and you're that powerful, knowing how to internally navigate the culture is a huge asset that the external company doesn't know. So I help them know where the minefields are. I've done this 10 times. If you choose to believe me, I can save you. So that gives you a sense of what that project was like. Okay, I think one of the one of the challenges I have in trying to understand what you uh, what you what you just described and kind of your career path, like it seems like um, these careers are very um, unique. It's not like I think in the maybe the olden days or or kind of a more simplistic way of thinking, you can kind of think of a cookie cutter, you know, doctor's um, kind of route or an engineer's route, and then um, like it's kind of it's a little bit easier to kind of um, to think of, you know, many people who who follow a similar route or in a similar field, um, it seems like when in business in particular, or at least you know, from my perspective, um, it's quite like there, there may be as many routes as there are people, and everyone's mm -hmm. found, you know, uh, there's so many niches and so many different things, and um, are, I guess is that true? And if if so, like, is there a way to kind of simplify a little bit and make it seem like lay out part of your path that's that is multipliable that that would be kind of like a not generic like generic in, in this in this helpful sense not generic in a quality sense that uh, a less 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 quality with less quality right 
so I think there's multiple things. I'll try to answer this and then maybe I'll take that prayer break. Um, so a couple of things. This is maybe five or six years old. So I think the numbers will be even more now, but about five or six years ago, um, there was a study that said the average person coming out of college will change jobs um, somewhere between 10 and 15 times over the course of their career, which is far different than my father's generation where my father worked with the equivalent of AT&T for his whole career. In fact, the company became AT&T over there. Like they changed names, but he had kind of the same job with the same company his whole life, like what Sheikh was saying. Um, we think that dynamic is changing in part because the social contract between employers and employees is also different, right? So I, what happened with the, with the layoffs right now, there's a very prominent Stanford professor um, who's, who said that the vast majority of these layoffs are copycat layoffs, not economically driven layoffs. So one or two companies did it first everyone else got a shot to do it. So they did it because they didn't have the mechanisms to do it before. Culturally, it was not appropriate. A company like Google, which is sitting on cash, could run for years without laying anyone off if it wanted to, right? Okay. Um, so I think the reality is most people, unless they, they own their own business or are in fixed careers like, like a medicine or perhaps academia, um, will likely change their careers multiple times. Um, now, a number of them are because, well, they did what mom and dad told them to, and I'm, I'm speaking this in a secular sense here, and at some point they wake up and like, well, I can't live someone else's life. Like, this is the narrative, right? And so I have to live my own life, and they don't know, they don't take the time to think, and so here they are now suddenly in their mid-30s or 40s figuring this out for the first time, right? So as we think about how this goes forward, and I'll, I'll relay my story too, because I think my, my story, so I'll come back to that in a bit, but I believe if we take the time to differentially invest in our whys, and then you seek to pursue what I, what I suggest are these safe to learn experiments and how we apply that why, you will get to your calling, what you feel to be your calling, I think sooner rather than later. It may so happen to be one of the traditional paths that exists, but I'll tell you that it's my belief, and there's a book, it's called Dumbing Down America. If you want, you can read it. Um, sorry, sidebar there, Dumbing Down America, award-winning teacher in New York public school system, after he got tenure, wrote his truth on what the education system in America is doing. And What's his name? TLDR. John, oh, it's an you know, Italian maybe, name, right? Definitely, maybe. I remember the title of the book. I am now, I'm not remembering John, the author. Yeah, okay, the yeah. Yeah, and so he basically said the education system that started around World War, post-World War I, by the Carnegies and Rockefellers and others, the Harvards and the Stanfords and the University of Chicago's of the world was to build good employees and good citizens. And the good citizens were helping the good employees and vice versa. So there was this kind of industrial complex, right? And there's all sorts of data how education dropped by all obvious measures, but we got good employees and we got good citizens. So it was never about education, right? And the, the kind of, um, tried and true paths are feeders into this industrial complex, you know, for the most part. And then you have some exceptions who create big, um, you know, co companies, they're co-opted to join and all of a sudden they become part of the capitalists and the rest of us by and large are getting our subsistence wage, right? That's kind of what the system is. So I'm waxing a little philosophical, but as a board member in the school, you know, one of my philosophies is to um, really drive independent thinking and to the extent that we can be owners of our own business and our own capitals in service of ourselves, our families, our community, and our team. So again, getting back to your why. If you're clear on your why, then I think you kind of, um, you have your radar attuned and you won't readily fall into that magnetic pull of kind of these companies and, and the simple employee structure. Um, I think that's what it, I think that's where the system goes. Now, if, for myself, you know, what was my why? He started with me being the son of Iranian immigrants. So I was born in Chicago. So a lot of people say they're from Chicago, but they're all from the suburbs, et cetera, right? But I was born in Chicago a couple of years there. And then we moved out to a city called Hoffman Estates. And I went to Barrington High School and not too far from where Beitel Elm is now. Uh, but there was no Beitel Elm then, sadly. <laughs> um, but as that child, um, I was at once the oldest adult, sorry, the youngest adult and the oldest child. 
So as the oldest child, there were few adults or older brothers. Like I wanted to buy to like say, hey, look, Omi John, there's like, I'm four or five years older than you. Here are the steps and this is what you need to do. And I never really found that person. And so I, I had this like obligation that if I can play that role for others, um, like in a heartfelt way, I do that because I remember that Omid and what that would have meant for him. So my step into coaching and wanting to go into teaching and even into Hausa, all of it is rooted in kind of that sentiment and how do I create that space, right? Um, now, over, over time, uh, I, I didn't listen to that voice all the time. So like in our culture, the honorific titles are engineer and doctor, right? So you're the engineer or you're a doctor and my father was an engineer. I didn't, um, what I observed of how he lived his life, I didn't want that for myself. I attributed it to his career. So I closed engineering. That wasn't the correct assessment, but that's what I did. And so I was going to be a doctor. And so I went to Stanford and I, I happened to be on scholarship. So I came in from modest means. It was a, a business scholarship, um, also financed by Disney. So I could either be a business student or an art major because of the Disney angle. Um, so business was the way forward um, because of the scholarship. I was taking the medical classes. Uh, and you know, when I got into the hospital environment and around the blood and these are the kinds of things, um, it didn't suit my constitution. It's a very noble profession, but it was honestly depressing. And so it wasn't until after my sophomore year that um, I, I stepped away from, um, from medical school. And frankly, the other thing was the prospect of paying for medical school, again, with my modest means, I didn't want to put that upon myself nor upon my, my parents. So financial means weighed heavily on me. Um, I now view that differently. Our risk comes from Allah, and, and that was also a limited mindset, but that's, that's where I was at that time. Um, in high school, my aim was to get into a Stanford, and so I took all the classes, I did all the stuff, and I didn't know it was going to be Stanford, but a place like that, and I got there, and I humbled, I got the scholarship. One of the principal mistakes was, though, thinking I had arrived. So, like, you know, once you achieve a goal, the next goal, the next, there, it's never ending. And it's not about competing with other people. It's ultimately with yourself, right? And inshallah, it's in service of our imam and Allah. Um, however, I had this sense of having arrived for a year or two. Um, and Stanford is not a place that gives you a lot of handholding. So some schools have very robust career services and that. And here it's kind of like, you made it here. You were smart enough to get here, smart enough to figure it out. And um, I was on my own. So I, I stumbled a little bit. Um, and then towards the end of um, um, junior year, start of senior, oh yeah, I need to get a job. Um, so I got a degree in economics. Um, I, I like academics. I got into a academically based consulting firm um, um, centered by partners, like business, like our partners in the company were university professors. And so many of the most prominent universities had professors. And so I initially got into Berkeley or the group in Berkeley and then transferred to Northwestern because I wanted to be close to home. My family was in Chicago. Um, I did that for a year. Um, I will tell you that uh, I, I had a bigoted Jewish boss um, and uh, that was very hurtful. Um, um, but it raised to the fore that I need to sort elements of my own background and my dean now, because um, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it later. And that's how I then got into the Hosawi program with uh, Sheikh Faizi, later on went to Qom. Um, I wish I was in Qom uh, longer. Um, um, you mentioned maybe it was a year. It's actually only about three or four months. Um, and because what happened during that time is I would come home to Tehran on the weekends because a lot of my family was in, is in Tehran. And I would come back and I would be weighted like psychologically and spiritually weighted down. And I couldn't make heads or tails of it. So then I talked to the, the um, some of the ustads, the teachers there, and they said, you know, we've had many cases like you and there's no fruit, there's no tamar, tamarat, there's no blessing, if you will, um, uh, in, in your studies here. And at the root of it, I said was, I don't think my family approves, although they have never said anything to me, but in their hearts, they don't approve. And they said that, well, look, you know, service to family, after, particularly parents, comes first. Um, they advised me to do a couple of things, do some reflection and come back. And then the council was, well, then you, sh you should go. So I came back to uh, America 
uh, almost like reverse immigration because my parents had moved to Iran. Uh, I came to Chicago with $500 and that's it. And I started from scratch. Um, so I started teaching. Because again, that, that role of teacher, and I was uh, sorry, I I'm, maybe should pause now, or is this helpful? Or It's very helpful. Um, I, I want concerned about your prayer. Um, let me let me give you a pause here. You um, bow out and pray, pray, and then come back, inshallah. We'll pick All up right, right here where you left off. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Please go All ahead. Right. Thank you. Uh, so I, in this instance, I just came back from, back to Chicago from Qom. I chose Chicago because that's the only home I had outside, even though I only have, no longer had family there. I had five hundred dollars, and uh, actually, here's a um, maybe an emotional thing. Um, while I was a Hosa student in uh, in Chicago, I had a medical accident, and uh, you know we were supposed to be insured, but you know when you when you work with a community, some things are are creatively accomplished. Let's just put it that way. So when I was in uh, Qom, these medical payments were, were accruing. Um, and when I came back, it's only when I found out that um, it, uh, they, they hadn't been paid. So uh, I came back with $500 to my name, about 5,000, six, five, six, 7,000. At that time, a lot of money of uh, unpaid medical expenses. My credit was um, a foul and the people who were to be doing it wash their hands of me. Uh, and uh, I mean, Allah is just too, too much. So it was the day of Eid al-Qadir. I mean, I didn't choose that day. It just happened to be that day. And I went to the hospital and uh, I found whoever the finance head was. And I came with all my bills. I said, here I am. Like, I'm not running. I'm not hiding. I don't have any money. So what do we do? And the woman looked at me and said, okay, when you were receiving these bills, were you earning any income? I said, no, I was a seminary student. That's all I need to hear. Debt forgiven, that was by AD. I had no idea, but I just showed up, right? And I, I think that's one of the success factors in life. It's not me chest pounding, but we're sharing in-house, you need to show up and you need to have the right intention and you need to know that Allah knows and Allah never fails his promises and he opens doors that you can't imagine, you know, in uh, Surah Talaq, right, that he opens the shape and same thing. But so I came back, 500 to my name, was in shock and that was my test. He's like, okay, how are you going to show up? Are you going to actually look to fulfill the responsibilities as you understand them or not? Mm. I, I said, I got I to gotta man up. I got to own whatever happened. And I didn't point fingers. I, had, I was disappointed in how I was engaged, but I still have to engage. I had a choice. And then one thing after another began to unfold. Okay, so the debt thing was removed. I started to be an interpreter because I knew language. I started to teach for... Kaplan, like SAT, ACT, graduate school type stuff. Um, also Chicago Urban League, which is a, a urban organization that seeks to help underprivileged, mostly either African-American or Latinx folks. So I started teaching there. Again, somehow helping the underdog was always in my thing. And I, I couldn't find a critical mass of Muslims, so I helped these folks. There, my teacher's like, why don't you get an MBA? Because I said I wanted to help third world countries. Well, hey, go get a business degree, help create jobs, blah, blah, blah. I was like, dude, I just came back from Iran in a seminary with all the Ayatollahs. Like, what, what MBA program is going to... So I applied. Um, I only applied to Chicago schools because I wanted to stay local. Uh, I got in. And um, my aim was to um, help understand how to run businesses so that I could help other people do that. Because again, I was fixated on finances. So for me, financial freedom was a source of other freedom. So it wasn't dollars for the sake of dollars, but if, if I could help people stand on their own two feet, then they could lift two people up or they could have more courage in how they show up in their workplace, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so 
so I got my MBA, um, fully debt financed. Um, so I, I, I went into $150,000 in debt, um, got a consulting um, job um, because I wanted to learn how people who know how to run businesses run businesses so that I could then do it myself. Um, okay, um, what was that term, debt finance? Yeah, debt finance. So I, I, I got all, all maxed out on loans. So I, I didn't get any, for whatever reason, I didn't get any scholarships. So I, I was fully scholarshiped on um, undergrad but I went on hundred percent loan for, for grad school. So you'd have to pay side. that back once you're done with it. Right. Okay. Um, I had four months between graduation and the start of school. Uh, so I came to Iran at that time. Again, my parents were there and for the first time I went and I visited um, rather than going to all the uncles and aunties and dinner parties, which is kind of normal when you come back, you know, you're six, seven pounds heavier. I went and I actually tried to see the country. Um, so I went to the north of Tehran where lots of Western type stuff happens, uh, with my cousins and they're like, oh, you don't want to go there. I'm like, look, um, I, I came and I want to see, so whether it's right or wrong, I, I chose to do that. Um, and I was, I was shocked. They, they took me to a ski area. There's nothing wrong with skiing. Um, they took me to the top of the ski area and, um, Islamic hijab wasn't observed, but it was like Western. Like, okay, look, I'm in San Francisco. I've seen that. Go inside. There's a huge table. And that's the first time that I saw drugs. I had never seen drugs. There was opium. There was hashish. There was marijuana. They're like, hey, you're from San... And I, out of embarrassment, I won't say it, but like, I was shot. I couldn't hang. I couldn't, I, I couldn't stay there, right? So I said, okay, saw that. Not going to do that. I had already been to home traveled to other places, um, and then um, went to Mashhad, and I made dua, and I said uh, to Imam Reza, I said, look, you know, in grad school, no one saw me with a woman on my hand, so much so that they thought I was gay. I'm going to be going to um, management consulting, where we travel, we go into hotels. There's a lot of rich food, and a lot of crazy stuff happens in hotels with people who have money and travel and are out of sight. I'm afraid. So if you don't solve my marriage problem, uh, I'm afraid. And uh, I'll come back to you if something like this happens. Uh, four days later, I met my wife. Hmm. We did our act in two weeks. Again, like know your responsibility. They're, they're real, they're alive. Um, so that's how I got half my dean. Um, it took us a year to get her green card. And then she came to San Francisco because I was based out of San Francisco. Um, and after a few months, I had the opportunity to uh, work on a project in Abu Dhabi. That was particularly relevant because her family couldn't get um, visas to come and visit us. You know, and so it's, I liken it like, you know, you pluck a flower and you put it in other soil and you hope that, you know, um, it doesn't wither. So I took the project so we could be closer. Um, that project became a five year stint in the Emirates. Uh, so we, we, we moved and we relocated to Abu Dhabi and later Dubai. Um, I couldn't get out of there fast enough, but we were, we were there for five years. And then when our children were en route, we came to the States and had them um, born here so that they would have citizenship, but also just the grounding and the rooting. Um, we, we felt that uh, Dubai was not a balanced place and the appearances were Islamic, but the underpinnings weren't so Islamic and that we were frankly better Muslims for whatever reason, we were better Muslims in the States. Like that was our reality. And so we came where we felt our Aqabat would be better. So we came to the States um, in between that time I switched companies. So I was with a different company and then I came to the Boston Consulting Group, went to um, uh, Boston, which was their headquarters, later moved to DC so I could stop traveling. Because uh, The model is you travel Monday through Thursday. So when I was in Boston, most of my clients happened to be in um, Manhattan. So I'd either take the train or a plane and I would be there. If I was lucky, I'd make Dwight Comail on Thursdays and on Fridays, I'd take my daughter to um, you know, her, her school, I'd be like the one time that I, she's the oldest, so 
in her car seat. And she was in the car seat. She's like, Baba, when are you going to be home? And it wouldn't be the first time, but it was one of those times where I was driving her to school. Um, I choked up and I was like, okay, that's it. Like, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get out of this consulting thing. Uh, at that time, we were in D.C. And interestingly enough, uh, so I had shifted from consulting to what I call um, transformation. In, in, um, in consulting, the business model oftentimes is you put together a very intelligent PowerPoint deck. That's the product, right? It's evolved, but still it's directionally like that. And it sits on a shelf. It actually doesn't do anything. And so I wasn't okay with that. And so I helped start what we call the large scale change and transformation practice at BCG. Grew it to a $2 billion business where it was, how do you actually change how people do things? Because results don't change unless behaviors change. And so ultimately what you're talking about is behavior change. And then as a Muslim who aspires to be a mu'min, this issue of behavior change, like you don't separate who you are privately. I don't, I don't anyway, privately and professionally. So there was a consonance there. Like, okay, it's really about the right behavior. Um, I gave a lecture uh, last summer in Mashhad around leadership. And um, I made the argument that leadership is nothing more than Muhammadi akhlaq. Like go and you find any leadership guru and it's really about the right, right akhlaq, right behavior. Um, so that's where I started to fixate and withdrew from, you know, the Wall Street Journal articles and the, I could run the numbers and I can crunch the stuff. But for me, it was really about the behavior. And so then I stepped away um, and read, led a transformation office in an energy company in Texas. And wherever we were in the States, we tried to be close to a large center because um, we felt that the masjid has to be a part of our lives. And also for my wife, who was an immigrant, she could find like-minded folks. It was easier for me to assimilate than for her. So in, in Boston, we were um, in Cambridge on the MAT side, and it was a very rich student community. In uh, DC, we were close to what's called IEC over there, and we followed that by IEC Houston. And now we're in IEC, basically IEC West, which is Sabah um, in, uh, on the West Coast. All of them had schools. Um, my children attended all three. My wife was a teacher at all, all of them. And me professionally, it continued to be a journey where, okay, now I'm, I'm getting away from the strategy and this. And also there's a lot of ego. Like I worked for, you know, the King of Jordan. I worked for the conference of uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, did a lot of fancy things in Saudi Arabia. Um, Met life, Gap. I, I can name drop and it gets to your head. And so there was also a, 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 um, a humbling that I needed to do. Um, part of that started um, when I got diabetes. So I was diagnosed um, between the transition from DC to Texas, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. Um, it wasn't conscious negligence and I should have seen it coming. I didn't. And it was only afterwards that then folks who had it in my family started sharing it. Like there's certain, um, levels of uh, disclosure that, that happened in the, my, the older generations of my family that are very different. So like my kids now who, the oldest of whom is 14, they know more, as much about diabetes as I do. Cause I don't want them ever to get it. Right. And I, I got the crash course after I got it. Right. Um, but there's also levels of disclosure that I like, so what's the lesson? Well, what, have, what have you been, Omid, what have you been holding back? You know, from myself, from others, from my family, Again, the aim is never to point fingers to others, but to what are the lessons? Um, so I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to go into HR because when you're in this high polluting business world, HR is like the help. And I mean that in a very disparaging way. It's where talent goes to die. It's where people who can't cut it go. Um, and I was like, well, actually, if I want to figure out that behavior thing and transformation and, and help the development side, the place is actually in HR. So I got, you know, kind of bit the bullet a little bit and went into HR. And when Google was interviewing me, they're like, so you want to be a human resource partner, do benefits and compensation? I'm like, no. So you want to be a recruiter? No. Like they couldn't figure out what to do with me. Like, so you're this consultant guy, right? I'm like, yeah. So we have this problem. Maybe you can come help us solve this problem. And after you do that, use that as a stepping stone to do whatever you want to do. I'm like, okay, well, what's the problem? And there's this word in business is called the gig economy. Um, it may be very common for the folks here where 
um, you, you work on a contract basis for a small project and then you go on to the next one and next one and next one and you can be an independent contractor of your own. Um, we have a gig economy problem at Google where um, almost half of our employees are gig. They'll come and work with us for six months, let's say in what was then called chauffeur, which is now Waymo, the driverless car company. They would work for us and then they would go to Uber or they would go to Apple's clandestine car company and take all of our IP with them. Like, how do we have temporary contracts but not lose our IP? Um, can you help us with that? It's like, sounds like an interesting problem. I don't know anything about it. You're gonna pay me to help try to solve that problem? Okay. So I came in and I did that. Um, and for reasons which I'll skip now, it wasn't really a developmental issue. It was a, it was a kind of a budgeting and legal kind of contracting issue, not a development issue. So we solved the problem, but it wasn't the kind of problem that I wanted to be working on. And, and at right around that time, they launched People Development, which is basically the internal group that helps Googlers become Googlers um, or stay Googlers or be Googly. And all of that means absolutely nothing, but like that, that's the wrapper. Like, hey, be Googly, what does that mean? Um, but think about it as, hey, we kind of want to be the best school anywhere from hire to retire. And what does that look like? And how can that be something that means people want to come back in part because they get to have something like this? That was the promise, right? So that's how I joined Google people development function. Um, now to go back to Sheikh Rizwan's, one of his questions was, it seems like it's like a zigzag path. Like, is there a way to make it more linear or whatever? I don't know that it's more linear, but I'm trying to share like, what was the compass, right? And so there, there was something around behavior, akhlaq, being the right person, not only like helping others, but also me. Like, I fundamentally believe we get what we are being. So if you're being that person with, the, like, I can't come and claim certain behavioral things if I'm not that person myself. Right, um, I can't have peace in my life, even in my professional life, if I don't have peace in my own personal life. And so there was multiple levels of like, parallel activity that were going on. I was becoming a different person. I was actually being at peace with what is it that I hope to do, and I think what I'm called to do. Um, and then there's an unfolding. I think you would be right in saying. It doesn't seem like there was a job app, like a job description and a profile that you which that you applied for. I kind of shaped them. Like so when I left BCG, um, I was in this transformation role. There was a company that kind of won a transformation. They didn't know what it was, and so they talked to me about it. And so we were we were, I was like talking to them in conversation, like, well, why don't you come do that here? And well, what does that look like? I don't know, you tell us. Basically, why don't you draw, write your own job description? Um, well, I need more, great, go hire the people that you need. Okay, I'm the, uh, and then um, uh, at Google, similarly, um, similar things have happened where I came in and I always wanted to do this coaching and they have uh, a very generous private edu like, uh, individualized education budget and um, I could use that to get my certification. And because it was related to my work, the job would pay, you know, two thirds of it. And so I became a certified coach and I kind of did that well. And then I became one of 40 internal executive coaches. Like everyone, lots of people will claim lots of things because the governance at Google is very weak. Um, so thousands of people, yeah, I have a coach. Uh, but I was one of 40 people like on the bench, like recognized to do that sort of thing. I was like, you know, going from not having done it to being one of 40 internal folks. I was like, alhamdulillah. Um, now it's not all roses because I didn't always have that that beacon and sometimes I let myself go and I, sometimes I had scares where I needed to take a time out. So like right at the beginning of um, COVID, uh, March of 2020, I had a heart attack. So I learned some lessons after I got diabetes, but apparently I didn't learn all the lessons I needed to learn. Um, so I had that heart attack. Um, and you know, balance. So, as much as I like to think I'm Superman, or if you if you're from the MCU, Marvel, or whatever, like whatever, if I'm some sort of superhero, um, there's got to be balance, and there will be a comeuppance at one point in time. And so, like, um, you know, like we got a big, fan not a big fancy house, but in California, everything's a little bit more expensive, at least by my baseline comparison in Chicago. We bought a nice forever home, we thought, and 
after the heart attack, I had to get rid of all stress and the stress of having a mortgage was actually pretty big. Okay, so we sell the house, we'll rent. We're renting in a place right now, right? Um, I can give a, a plus effort all the time or maybe sometimes I can give B, B plus effort. You know, so I haven't worked on weekends. Yesterday I happened to work on a Saturday, but I'm the school soccer coach and I coach my, my son and, and we're invested in PSAT you know, preparation with my daughter. And I, I do probably more than I should, but like that's, that's how and where I wanna be. Um, but that requires trade-offs. Um, how are we doing in time? Uh, we'll, we'll About five after. more minutes. <clears throat> let, let me show, uh, there's a lot we can do. And if, it, if it's of interest, I'm happy to come back again. But my parting gift will be this uh, with, with, with your permission, uh, Shay. Uh, alhamdulillah with the Sawa community, um, my son and I went on uh, ZR at this like winter holiday uh, in Iran and, and, and the principal sites in Iraq. Uh, my wife and daughter had gone um, the ladies version the year prior. So that the boys went this year. Um, and we ended our trip in Najaf. So I was in Najaf. This was um, maybe half hour, 45 minutes before Fajr. And I was maybe five, five meters from the Zari. So like still under the dome praying Alhamdulillah, um, right before Fajr. And to my right, there was a Sayyid who I think was in Sajda for 30 or 45 minutes. And to his right was one of the ulama from our, of our trip. So while he was in Sajda, I, I noticed, and he was a, it was obvious he was a spiritually um, special individual because of what was, like you can vibe with someone. He was, he was in a different place. And so I told myself, as soon as he's done with Sajda, I got to ask this guy some stuff because he, he's got some stuff to give. And the other Adam, I'm sure, remarked the same to himself because as soon as his head popped up, he was on it. <laughs> so he beat me to the punch. <laughs> and they started asking, he started getting into a conversation. It got personal very fast. And from an Adabi perspective, I didn't, I, I got up so I didn't, I didn't hear stuff that I shouldn't hear. Um, and then I saw the, the other alim um, a couple hours later and I said, you know, Salaam Alaikum, et cetera. And who was that guy? He was really special. And um, he's like, yeah, he was very special. And we went to conversation and thank you for giving me privacy. Uh, I said, look, if there's anything in that conversation that you can share, um, I would be much obliged. And he said, yeah, there's one thing he taught me and I'll, and I'll teach you. And uh, so Imam Ali has always been special for me. My dad's name is Ali. My son's name is Ali. So I'm Abu Ali, Ibn Ali. I'm no Kara Ali. Like, I, I, just, I just love Imam Ali. So something to come in his haram that way meant a lot to me. So the, the dhikr, you say it, and then I'll say what the dhikr is. You, uh, you say it uh, seven times after Maghrib and seven times after Isha. And I'm not a huge dhikr. I think doing your salat at the right time Doing salat al layl that's maybe the most powerful dhikr for basic people like me. But here's the dhikr that he shared, and it was Elahi bi hurmatil amir al mu'minin or zubn al yaqeen. Um, Sheikh could translate it better than me, but I, I understand it to mean, um, you know, Elahi, O God, by hurma, like honor of Imam Ali, uh, give me or make part of my rizq yaqeen. Yeah. Um, and if you have yaqeen, I mean, in the short sense, like you won't sin. If you don't sin, then all the other doors open up for you. Like if you have yaqeen, you have everything. I don't want to overstate it, but that was the, that was the lesson there. And I think that's been kind of the thread in my life. I can't claim that I have yaqeen, but it was these building blocks where I had seminal moments. Um, and then the realization that it's not me. So when you have yaqeen, you have relinquished yourself and you've relinquished yourself to Allah, then Allah becomes your hands and your eyes and your ears. And then all you do is win. So even if outwardly you're losing, you're still winning because well, you're thankful and you're gracious and you're waiting because Allah is gonna deliver. If you're winning outwardly, you're not arrogant and you're kind and you're giving of that which Allah has given to you because you're just a steward and then you get more because you're grateful. Um, so I think that if I close the point, I think that's the, if we can get to that place, the unfolding will happen. And then do you have the yaqeen? Can you trust? Because he, he won't let you down. Mm -hmm. 
Do you all have any questions for him? I mean, is it safe to say or fair to say that, um, like, I think this is what you're probably trying to communicate is that that why um, the pursuit of like why you're doing things or why you live or why you like that was that's the constant even though you've gone through so many different kind of like kind of meandered through all these kind of um, amazing career uh, paths mm -hmm. and com companies and accomplishments and whatnot is that is that fair to say uh, yes I, I think that's fair to say um there's a there's a, a moving secular example. Um, Steve Jobs, um, while he was alive, gave a commencement speech at Stanford. You can watch that on YouTube if you want, if you wish. And he talks about how you can connect the dots looking back. You know, he dropped out of school, then did a calligraphy class, and that calligraphy class became the basis of the fonts that went into the Mac and the Mac da da da, and then the Apple and like. But as the dropout of university, who's just like hanging in the calligraphy class, like he had no idea what was coming down. And he had a version of this why that was moving him from one spot to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And then he could kind of look back. Now we have the richness of Islam where um, I don't think it has to be so blind of a forward looking view. I won't claim to have that clarity. That's my weakness. Um, and yeah, I think you have articulated that point. Hmm. Musa, you have a question? Uh, this might be a bit of a long answer. So like if there isn't uh, if there isn't time, I understand. But you mentioned how like through every stage in your life you're just like Allah knows best I'll, this my plan is for Allah you mentioned. Um you went to Imam Raza's shrine, you went to Hosea, you're like I want to first solidify my my deen. So how do you how would you say you understood that or you kept yourself as close as you could to Islam through all the difficulties of of um, of school and of the culture of like California, of Google, of moving a lot for work and things like that? Um, so two things come to mind. One, I think of a, as a university student, um, one ni'mah that Allah gave me um, was I had a conscience. So whilst I wish I would never make mistakes, um, uh, I did make mistakes. We, we were taught not to publicly air our mistakes. That's not the right thing to do. And I, I made mistakes. Um, and as I made them, um, Allah blessed me with having a conscience. So I, 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 I was aware. And so that, that never shut down. Because if that shut down, I would have been lost. So what I did or how I did or why Allah allowed me to maintain my conscience so that I could, you know, do my repentance and inshallah not repeat and come back. I'm not sure, but one thing I had that. And so the 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 thing is, well, A, inshallah, no one makes mistakes. Um, I, I hope that's the case for some of us. The reality is we probably will make mistakes. Do we have a conscience about it? If you do listen and there's a, there's a course, if you don't, I think that's a huge Thing that must be addressed. There's something wrong if you don't have a conscience. The other thing is, um, so I've been introduced to some folks and, and now after many, many years, I do have some mentors who spiritually are um, in places that I hope to be. Um, and I find them very reluctant because they're also overseas. Um, so they, they rarely um, tell me do's and don'ts. Uh, and, and I recently spoke to one of my mentors uh, about this, and um, the thing that he said was, um, I'm trying to figure out the specifics of it, but basically when, when you have submitted and when, when really your aim is to please Allah, then the doors and the floor and inanimate things will become your teachers. Like he's basically telling me, stop looking for a teacher, that like you can have them, but the lessons are everywhere if we're looking for them. It's in the subway interaction that you have with a stranger. It's from your mother, your sister, with others. Um, you know, Facebook is a, uh, is a place that, or social media is a place that I think in our circles, it tends to be more negative than not, right? Um, and then I found a practical Islam group 
um, which has some things and there they're talking about Sayyid Qazi and Ayatollah Bahchat and Alama Taba Tabai, Imam Khomeini. Um, like if you, the doors open. Now the, the 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 challenge for me was I was a hardworking per I still am, but a hardworking student putting effort, you get the effort that you put in. Um and in this last kind of decade in my life, the greatest progress I've made is not through the efforts, but it's through what Allah has granted me. Like sometimes he just gives you stuff and you don't maybe even deserve it, but that's the biggest move. Like Sayyid Ghazi, um, Allah Shaykh um, um, Rizwan described ways, but he's like one of the teachers of uh, Ayatollah Bahcha. He was a normal Mulana until, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years old, some, some late stage in his life does ziyarat of uh, Hazrat Abu al-Faz for the first time and the nur, like the nur from the surah, that nur was granted to him and then he became the person that he is. Allah gave it to him. And so then I got curious, what kind of person do I have to be in order to do that? Well, you need to be in a relationship with Imam Mahdi. You need to stop by sinning. You need to do your salat awal al-waqt and you need to do salat al-layl and you need to be in a relationship with Quran. Not a lot of things, but it's like, okay, I'm just going to focus. And I'm, I'm telling you this as a, as a 46 year old, right? But I was on a path of asking why, what does it look like? I stumbled, I tried, I had to be humbled. Uh, and it wasn't until after the humility, because arrogance is one of the sins. And it's, it's one of, it separates us from Allah, because then I, I think I'm a something. And I had those challenges because of the badges I've got or the money I made or the whatever. And I, I, I. Um, so that was my struggle to like reduce the I. I will also say that gender relations in the West was a particularly strong struggle for me. So these two things at a personal level were, the, were like the Shia team that I had to combat. And then as I progressed, then these other doors began to open up. I think our time is up. It's actually very different from what I expected, I mean, but I think it was a very, um, yeah, it was kind of a, an insight into some, yeah, something um, very meaningful and kind of spiritual when I expected it to be kind of like, here's, here's what I did first, here's what I did second, and here's the path that you should follow, and here's the school you should go to, and here's the company you should work for. So it's actually very, quite, quite unique and, and interesting. Um. Well, thank you. Um, I can give you that version too, if you like. You know, if that's no. That's some serious. Somehow, I think this was. Um, yeah, this was. This was probably, well, more useful. Definitely more authentic and maybe more more effective for for all of us. Well, well, well thank, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm reachable in many, any number of ways. So, if folks wish to reach out, you're more than welcome to. Okay. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I look forward to being in conversation going forward as well. Inshallah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Wa alaikum assalam.